It's football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome in, Winning Cures Everything. It is the Thursday, September 22nd edition of the show. I am, of course, your host, Gary Seegers. You can follow me on Twitter at GaryWCE. Hopefully, everybody is having a wonderful Thursday thus far. And I am excited about college football week four. We've got much to discuss as far as news goes, as far as our preview. And I've got 12 games that I will be uh, breaking down very quickly, I like to give out a pick on all the games that we did not get a chance to discuss, of course, on the Bet US College Football Show. But that brings me to this. This show is powered each and every time out by Bet US. It is America's online sportsbook, America's premier online sportsbook. They are where the game begins. You can check them out over at betus.com. Also, also, very, very smart idea here. Use the link in the description to make sure that you go and get signed up over there. And also, I host the BetUS College Football Show over at BetUS TV. Go ahead and check that out. Uh, the past three, no, four weeks, if you count week zero, of course, I am 15-4 and four against the number. So make sure that you go back and you watch Tuesday and Wednesday's shows. Uh, lots of good picks, lots of good analysis, etc. from myself, Parker, and Kyle. So make sure that you dive into that. If you have not already... Sign up for the Picks Contest. Of course, you can go over to winningcureseverything.com and click on Contest right there. It will take you where you need to go to get signed up. The winner of that each week gets a $25 Amazon gift card, and and we're going to toss in a $50 free play from BetUS, etc. So there's a lot to discuss to go along with that, but make sure that you are signed up for the Picks Contest. Let's go ahead and get into it. We've got a lot to break down, a lot to dig into. Let's start off with number one here, and that would be conference realignment could hinge on Amazon. Of all the different (laughs) broadcast companies that would be, I guess, key in who ends up in which conference, Amazon could be the one that really details it. And the way that that could go through, uh, if you check out cbssports.com, Dennis Dodd has a good article about it. Uh, It says, conference realignment, Amazon interest may affect Big Ten, Big 12, and Pac-12 composition as talks continue. It says, further realignment could be on the horizon as media rights packages remain outstanding. So here is the situation. Amazon is very interested in getting college football rights. Now, their NFL debut did incredibly well. Uh, They had over 15 million viewers that tuned in for the stream. They had an average, if I'm not mistaken, of over 13 million people that watched uh, the Chargers and the Chiefs. Now, they don't expect that from whatever TV deal they end up going with, whichever conference, but they are talking to the Big Ten, the Big 12, and the Pac-12. Well, why does that make any difference? Obviously, all of these, the Big Ten just signed this massive contract, uh, the Big 12 and the Pac-12 obviously uh, are working out media negotiations, media rights negotiations with ESPN and with Fox. But the issue here is quality content for Amazon. If they want to do a deal with the Big 10, that would mean that the Big 10 would need to go and get more inventory and Amazon would get the bare end of that inventory. They would get the very least little bit. They've got 112 games that are already accounted for. If you go out and you bring in two other teams, you can find a way to get more games out of that, obviously, uh, because you're going to get nine more conference games per team out of each one. So you've got at least 18 more games there. But does Amazon want to pay a bunch for the low end of Big Ten? Uh, Probably not. So what you're going to try and do is figure out which top tier is worth more. Is that in the Pac-12 or is that in the Big 12? And whichever one Amazon decides that they want to work with, and not necessarily top tier, but even the secondary rights, right? The tier two games that they can get, which one is going to be worth more to the company? Which one, and and that's where it gets tricky, is you got to figure out not only who is more tech-savvy, but who is more willing to 
uh, buy an Amazon subscription to be able to watch their team. Right? So if you bring up, oh, yeah, the Pac-12, obviously out west, on the west coast, they know a lot more about computers, et cetera. And this is all stereotypical stuff, right? But you would think that the west coast would be more willing to stream content as opposed to just watching it linearly. Well, the issue with that is how many of those people are willing? How many of them are passionate enough about their teams in order to go through the trouble of going with a new streaming service, right? That's that's where it gets tricky because in the Pac-12, yes, the name brands might not be as big, but you might have more passionate fans that care more about their teams. That's where this whole thing gets tricky. So if Amazon decides, yeah, we're going to put our stock into the Big 12, well, that will absolutely affect the bottom line of the Pac-12. And in that situation, uh, the Big 12 is going to be making more money per team there more than likely will be a clause for expansion. Uh, And if the Big 12 wants to bring in some of those Pac-12 teams, well, that could effectively just end the Pac-12, right? That's where it gets tricky. So if the Big 12, obviously we've talked about this in the past, Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, Colorado, they want to bring in those four that makes a 16-team league much the same as the SEC and the Big 10. No, it's not on the same caliber, but it is still uh, effectively ending the Pac-12 conference, at least as a viable Power 5 conference. And who would have thought that Amazon, of of all streaming companies, of all broadcast partners, would be the one that would end up making this decision because I don't think it's going to be too far off the difference per school what ESPN and Fox are willing to pay to the Big 12 and or the Pac-12, right? I think both of them are going to get deals. It's just who does Amazon want to give that much money to. It's going to be really tricky. I am very interested to see what is going to end up coming out of this. But man, uh, Amazon calling the shots, trying to figure out who they want, who they are going to make a viable contender, a viable conference. Whew, unbelievable. Unbelievable. We had news out of the SEC today, and LSU, their NCAA uh, sanctions were handed down today. And this is a very interesting one. Uh, Obviously, when that news broke, everybody perks their ears up and they automatically start thinking, hmm, okay, what is this in regards to basketball? Is this in regards to da-da-da-da-da? Well, obviously, we are a college football show here at Winning Cures Everything, so we are going to focus on football. And here is what went down, pulling up the tweet from Brody Miller. And Brody uh, says, LSU has been given one year of probation a $5,000 self-imposed fine, a limit of 55 official visits during the current academic year, along with other penalties. Uh, It says former LSU assistant James Craig was given a three-year show cause. Now, this is where it's funny, right? Shea Dixon, of course, um, Shea Dixon is at On3 Sports. He covers LSU recruiting, etc. He said LSU had already self-imposed nearly everything that was on this NCAA list, beginning with the prior regime. They've also already been operating under the number set at 55 official visits. Nothing of real note uh, when it comes to moving forward. So there's really nothing that's a big deal about this NCAA probation for LSU other than it does show that it, in some cases, it pays to cheat, right? The NCAA found that James Craig committed a level two violation, meaning that LSU can bring to its court appeal that it might have had to cause, but uh, they might have had cause to fire James Craig last summer. They can potentially avoid paying the five hundred thousand dollars that they owe him. We have seen this over and over and over again. Schools using NCAA violations in order to get out of paying buyouts. We saw it with Kansas. What they tried to do with David Beatty before they hired Les Miles. We saw it with Tennessee, with uh, Jeremy Pruitt, and there's still lawsuits and everything else going on with that. Um, But they are using these NCAA violations in order to get out of paying these gigantic buyouts. And it's insane. It's absolutely insane to me that it's even a possibility for them to do this. And yet, the people that wrote these contracts are doing a good job of, uh, what's the word? They are, we'll call it CYA, right? That's exactly what they're doing. They are making sure 
that if they want to get out of a contract because it's not working, there are a lot of loopholes. There are a lot of different clauses that they can point to and they can find a way to get out of paying that money. It's not great for coaches. Don't get me wrong. But the fact that these coaches are making just gargantuan sums of money, uh, totally fair. You better play by the rules. Now, that's the that's the catch-22, right? Play by the rules, probably not going to win. Not going to be as effective winning, at least not at these big-time programs. Uh, you don't play by the rules, and you get busted, and you're not winning, eh, you might not get your money when you get bought out. Just saying, which in that case, I guess it wouldn't technically be a buyout. You wouldn't be getting bought out at all. You'd just get fired. Anyway, moving along, more SEC news here. Kentucky, very interesting news article that I ran across. Uh, This was over at Saturday Down South. Now, obviously, it's been reported at a bunch of different places, but Kentucky has five football players that are going to file or have already filed a lawsuit against the Lexington Police Department. Now, this is from Eric Woods over at Saturday Down South. Five Kentucky football players are reportedly filing a lawsuit against the Lexington PD after being charged with burglary, but later cleared. So, this story is bonkers. The police say, and this is all from the article, the police say that the group of Andrew Phillips, Vito Tisdale, Reuben Adams, Juton McLean, and Joel Williams were asked to leave an Alpha Sigma Chi fraternity party on Forest Park Drive and being involved in a fight, accusing them of, quote, forcing entry. It says the police also accused them of having a gun. Uh, the players said that they thought it was an open invite. Uh, apparently, they were called racial slurs. They were told to leave. They said that they were jumped when they were trying to leave. Uh, according to one of the lawsuits, the fraternity was picking out names from the Kentucky roster as they filed charges. They didn't actually know the guys that came to the party. They gave all this to the police. The police actually went and arrested all of these different guys that may not have actually been there. Like, it's just insane to me. Um, But it says that the police used unreliable information in the accusations against the players. How this turns out is going to be very interesting. Now, everybody knows that college police departments, uh, it's very, very interesting. And it's at least college town police departments. Uh, The fact that football players were actually arrested as opposed to them just giving this information over to head coach Mark Stoops and letting him handle the discipline, that was interesting. Right, that's that's where this whole thing gets a little crazy, but I'm I can't wait to see what is going to come out of this, because man, uh, if they find a way to successfully sue the Lexington Police Department, what is that going to mean going forward? And the fact that they've already done this, they've already filed the lawsuit against them, um, you might see more arrests in Lexington. Just throwing that out there, because that's something. You know, when somebody gets a a grudge or a vendetta against somebody or another group of people, uh, you start to see things just tailspin drastically. So I'm sure this is not something that Mark Stoops wanted to have to deal with, but here we are. Here we are. That's going to be something to pay attention to going forward. Interesting article from the News and Observer over in North Carolina. This is a, This is a tricky one. North Carolina's FOIAs, right? Obviously, a lot of people put in FOIA requests after USC and UCLA joined the Big Ten because they wanted to know exactly what was going on inside different athletic departments as this happened. But North Carolina, uh, all of their stuff was finally released to the News and Observer, and it shows all the details into a college athletic department uh, after USC and UCLA announced they were going to the Big Ten. We're going to pull it up on the screen here. Uh, Andrew Carter is the reporter on this one. And there's a lot of interesting stuff as far as the text messages from Bubba Cunningham, the AD, and Kevin uh, Gushwitz. I hope I say that right. The university chancellor there, uh, as the news began to spread of another round of major conference realignment, you know, they scheduled a meeting. They're going through all this. Uh, It does show that Bubba Cunningham had a talk with Jim Delaney, of course, the former Big Ten commissioner, about what exactly was happening. Um, And it does say, uh, let's see, that Delaney told him, or that Delaney preached patience and planning, no need to rush right now. Which Delaney obviously had to be involved in all this. Right now, he's a consultant for the Rose Bowl, but I also believe that he knows exactly what's happening in the Big Ten at all times. At all times. 
So uh, you roll through some of this, and uh, of course it goes into navigating a period of transition, and et cetera, et cetera. You scroll on down, um, and you get to a very interesting section here where it says patience and planning. It says, for UNC and other ACC schools, there's little choice then but to follow the advice Delaney provided Cunningham in their long talk over the summer, patience and planning. Uh, it says that uh, Phillips was likely to address the AAC, or ACC's presidents and chancellors during their conference call the next morning. One of the talking points, as Cunningham described it, should we explore a partnership with the Big 12 or the Pac-12? Now, we did talk on this show multiple times about the idea of the ACC and the Pac-12 may be merging together, at least the remaining members of the Pac-12. Uh, they even had a name for it. They said, uh, we could have a super conference, both athletically and academically, probably would need to be called the Atlantic Pacific Athletic Conference, which would be APAC. Uh, maybe that's crazy, but if it would get us a better TV deal, it may be worth considering. And so Cunningham, of course, wrote back, we need to think about what outcomes we want, what are our priorities, do we want to maintain all teams in the ACC? That's interesting. Uh, is this a new league? Do we want to have the same number of teams at each school? It says, should we play a national schedule or a regional schedule? Uh, these are all interesting, interesting points. Now, obviously, you had to know that some of this stuff was going on um, because any everything is up in the air whenever something like this happens because you don't want to get completely left behind, but everybody in the ACC also understands that their grant of rights goes for another 14 years. They are locked in unless they get eight teams to decide that they do not like this current contract. That's it. That's all they got. You you have to get, and I don't believe that realignment would benefit eight of the 14 members uh, at all. So why on earth would they do this? Uh, do this? Now, if you were to join with the Pac-12, that could be interesting. Right, You could find a way to make that work. And then, of course, you drop off some of the dead weight. Uh, you create a whole new super conference. You don't maybe take all of the Pac-12 teams. You don't take all the ACC teams. You find a way to do that. But at the same time, then you have to find eight teams in the ACC that are willing to drop that. So do you bring six or eight from the Pac-12 and only eight from the ACC? If something like that were to happen, you could have a 16-team conference that is on both coasts. And you're leaving out what? Syracuse, Purdue, not Purdue, uh, excuse me, Syracuse, Boston College. Uh, I mean, I don't even know who you wouldn't take, right? That's where it gets tricky because they want this to be academic and athletic. So uh, that's something to pay attention to because that's something that they brought up here. Uh, really, really interesting. Like, do we want to maintain all teams in the ACC? Like, that's, that's where it gets tricky. I, I can't wait to see if there's more that ends up coming out of this, if the ACC finds a way to get out of their current deal with ESPN, their current grant of rights. Uh, do some of those schools want to leave? That's, that FOIA request was, was massive. Very, very big. Uh, let's move over to Auburn football. Mm -mm -mm. Brian Harson. Things are not going well for Harson this week. Obviously, uh, I didn't talk about this on the Tuesday show, but the fact that Auburn did not tweet out the final score from from the Penn State drubbing that they took that was interesting to say the least, right? Because it just became a huge deal, and it really shouldn't have. Because there are football programs that do this all the time. There's no telling what could have happened here, uh, but apparently somebody saw. The final score graphic tweeted out, and then it was deleted. Who knows? Uh, Brian Harson coming out at the press conference and explaining that the reporters and the writers don't know what was going on in that football game. Mm, not the way that I probably would have handled that, personally. But regardless, uh, you get through the week, and you're getting ready to take on Missouri. You know, TJ Finley's out this week, etc. You you just got some things that you got to work through this week. You finally got the bad stuff on the backside, and now you're moving to the front side. You're moving to the game on Saturday. And what do we have pop up? We have Aaron Suttles, who does the inside the state of Alabama recruiting. And it's the athletic, of course, Aaron Suttles, the Alabama beat writer over there. Uh, but it is interesting. 
the headline here, this is from the Auburn Daily over at Fan Nation, so it's an SI.com thing. Uh, it says, and this is Lindsey Crosby, the Athletics inside Alabama recruiting piece is illuminating in a bad way for the Tigers. It says Brian Harson said to be absent on the recruiting trail. Some of these quotes, uh, what what what's done here basically is they go through, it's an ongoing series where they go through and uh, he provides anonymity to high school coaches in specific states in return for candid assessments of the recru- uh, recruiting efforts and styles of the major programs in the state. Obviously, with Aaron Suttles, it is Alabama and Auburn. The high school coaches were not exactly kind to Brian Harson. We'll say that. We will certainly say that. Coach number two in the Mobile area. I got to be careful because I don't want to get hung out here, but Brian Harson has not been to our school. He's never been here. That's a surprise. They got a lot of outstanding recruiters on their staff, though. I think that Harson has put together a good staff, but I don't know the head coach there. Uh, that's interesting. Coach three in East Alabama. I think they do a good job or a great job. With us being close, it allows them to see a lot, too. I think they do a really good job, and I think it'll continue because our kids know most of the coaches that are there. Okay, well, that's Auburn is close to that, right? Close to East Alabama, so that does make sense. Uh, I mean, we call it West Georgia for a reason, right? They're all the way on the East. Uh, coach number six in Central Alabama. Uh, offensive line coach Will Friend does an excellent job. The running backs coach, Carnell Williams, is good. They've got a lot of outstanding young coaches. I think they're going to do well, but I don't know their head coach at all. Nick Saban comes to our school every year. Every year he makes a trip to our school, whether he's recruiting a guy or not. Okay, so that's two out of three that have not even met Harson. That's interesting. Coach one in Birmingham. Honestly, they do a poor job in recruiting. I've never met the man in person. Talking about Brian Harson. I do want to meet the guy because I think a lot of my kids could play at Auburn. But just as a rule, they just haven't done a very good job recruiting our kids. Okay, that's three out of four. Coach four in West Alabama. I took a player down there that had some good offers, and I don't think they realized who he was. Okay, red flag. <laughs> red flag. Uh, he said, but I'll tell you something cool about Harson, which is probably not the popular thing right now. I talked to that joker for about 45 minutes on the phone. That's not something you see coaches in Division One doing. You don't see any head coaches doing that, really. I thought that was really cool. I thought he did a good job. Now, this is... This is so interesting to me. Uh, Coach One had the most direct response to what the difference between Alabama and Auburn recruiting is. It says, boy, you're going to get me in trouble. The biggest difference, I guess, between Alabama and Auburn is every time there's a permissible time for Alabama to be out recruiting, they are out recruiting every permissible time. And I don't know that Auburn is doing that right now. If you want to know why Brian Harson is possibly going to be fired... This would be the answer, right? Uh, when the high school coaches in the state get against you or, or think that you are doing a poor job, that's going to kill your recruiting. Absolutely kill it. Now, it's one thing to sit and have a 45-minute conversation with one coach, right? Because think about the number of high schools, the, the number of high school football teams that are in the state. Nick Saban has to find a way to speak with all of them. Not necessarily routinely, but he finds a way to get there at least once a year, et cetera, because you have to have that relationship. That relationship matters, and I am of the belief that you have to have the kind of relationship where you shake somebody's hands, where you meet with them in person. It means more when you meet somebody in person. It's not the same even if it's a 45-minute phone call when you just call somebody. So Brian Harson, while it did win over you know, one of these coaches, I mean, there's a slew of them that did not exactly buy into this whole thing that say they don't even know him. That's terrifying if you're an Auburn fan. Terrifying. Last news item on the docket here. A Utah football fan, a student actually, was arrested and accused of making nuclear threats Unless Utah won last week against San Diego State. <laughs> this is from KSL.com. Uh, it's Pat Reavy is, is the uh, journalist on this one. 
Uh, it says that University of Utah student was arrested Wednesday after police say she threatened to detonate a nuclear reactor if the youth football team didn't win on Saturday. Uh, the 21-year-old woman was booked into the Salt Lake County Jail for investigation of making a threat of terrorism. Uh, on Saturday, Utah uh, hosted San Diego State at Ricicle Stadium. The woman posted threats of violence on the Yik Yak app before the game, stating that if the football team did not win the game, she was going to detonate the nuclear reactor that is located in the University of Utah, causing mass destruction. <laughs> now, I shouldn't be laughing about this, um, but my gosh, like, what are we talking about here? Utah fans, get a grip on things. Like, I understand losing at Florida was rough, but it, going to the swamp is difficult for anybody, all right? Uh, it says the arrest came just a few weeks after 19-year-old University of Utah student was arrested for an investigation of the same crime after he also allegedly used the Yik Yak app to make a bomb threat directed at the Spencer Fox Eccles business building. When that student was arrested, he said the threats were a joke. He had no intention of carrying them out. What is the deal? With these Utah students talking about detonating or, or setting off bombs or whatever. This is bonkers. Utah kids, get it together. Like, man, the stories I would imagine coming out of there. Y'all are nuts. Y'all are nuts, all of you. All right, let's go on and hit this on the backside. We're talking about where game day is going for week five. We're going to preview week four, et cetera. Let's check out some things you should know about. College football is back, and BetUS TV has you covered. Every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we've got expert game analysis to help you make informed decisions before kickoff, only on the BetUS TV College Football Channel. Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, gambling picks, merch, the gear we use, and more. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit BetUSTV.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports Show and, from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. All right. Where is college game day going in week number five? Obviously, this week they chose to go to Tennessee over Kansas. A uh, little crazy. At least to me, feels like you probably would have gotten a better crowd in Kansas. And don't get me wrong, they have not been to Knoxville since 2016. So it's been a while. I would imagine the Tennessee fans are going to be amped up for this one. They know that they can win this game on Saturday against Florida. I mean, they're a double-digit favorite in the game. So, yeah, I'm sure it's going to be just fine. Uh, we did have a couple of people associated with game day say that, you know, Kansas has to prove a little bit more to us. We just got to see a little more, and, and yeah, we'll probably try and make it out there. Okay, okay. Well, let's talk about the games. Let's go on and bring it up on the screen here, the schedule for next week. And obviously, we don't have a, uh, a lot of the times just yet. Now, they have announced some of these, but ESPN does not have them updated, so it is what it is. I believe Alabama-Arkansas is going to be the CBS game next week. So, uh, the games that I have here, Alabama-Arkansas. If Arkansas beats Texas A&M, uh, Arkansas will probably be up to number maybe eight roundabout. Like, I think they'll get a lot of credit for beating Texas A&M. Uh, if you get a number two versus number eight matchup, yeah, that one could be... That one could be the number one spot for game day to go next week. Uh, you do have NC State going to Clemson next week. That is a what could possibly be a top 10 matchup by next week, depending upon what happens You know, up in the top 11, of course. NC State's number 12 currently, and Clemson is number 5. Uh, you do have Oklahoma at TCU. TCU finds a way to get past SMU. Oklahoma finds a way to get past Kansas State. That's two undefeated teams right there. And uh, maybe two that are a little bit off the radar that we're going to bring up. Uh, if you look down just a touch at the 11 a.m. spot, and I didn't mean to move that. 
Uh, if you look at the da, 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 right about here, number eight, Kentucky at number 16, Ole Miss. Kentucky plays Northern Illinois this week. Ole Miss plays Tulsa. Both of them should get wins. That means both of them will be undefeated. Now, game day did this last year when Arkansas went to Georgia, and it was a battle of top 10 teams. It was an 11 a.m. game, and they went out there anyway. Would they want to go to the Grove for an early kick? That's where it gets interesting. And then finally, my, my last option here for them, if Iowa State beats Baylor and Kansas beats Duke, Kansas is hosting Iowa State next week. Now, neither of these teams are ranked currently, but if you have two 4-0 and teams, I, I believe, and that's a 2.30 kick right there, at David Booth Kansas Memorial Stadium, that could be the spot, right? Basically, what they want game day is for Kansas to go on and prove it one more time, get you to 4-0, and show that you've got a viable product here, and you bring in Iowa State, who could also be undefeated. I mean, they're a favorite at home over Baylor right now. They found a way to beat Iowa for the first time in forever. Uh, that could be fun. Because that's two fan bases that love getting college game day. Absolutely love it. So, that's my guesses. My guess will be Alabama and Arkansas, because I do think Arkansas is going to win on Saturday night. But after that, you got NC State-Clemson, Oklahoma at TCU, Kentucky at Ole Miss, or Iowa State at Kansas I would bet it's in Fayetteville, but we'll see. We will certainly see about that. Uh, cheers to game day. Still rock and rolling. Highest numbers that they've had in, what, a decade? I believe you bring on Pat McAfee. You're going to have a show that is must-see. Can't-miss type stuff. All right. Let's move into the preview for week number four. College football preview. Ready to rock and roll. And let's start off with this one. Which game this week is going to get the highest TV ratings? Now, some of you care about this. Some of you do not. Here are my guesses on it. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. I think that Wisconsin at Ohio State is going to get the highest TV ratings of the week because I think this thing's going to be closer than people assume it will be. Florida at Tennessee could end up getting quite a few ratings. It's certainly going to help if that game ends up close. But with that being a double-digit spread, it could be tricky. Tennessee could jump out to a big lead. If that happens, I would imagine... Probably going to lose part of that audience. Notre Dame at North Carolina. That's a 2.30 game on ABC. 2.30 Central, of course. God's time zone. But yes, uh, North Carolina-Notre Dame could be a close game. And if that is the case, obviously, there's a lot of people that like Notre Dame. A lot of people that hate Notre Dame. Uh, that's two big brands. Could be interesting. Uh, number four for me, Arkansas at Texas A&M. It's on ESPN. It is a Saturday night game. Uh, again, keep it close. Oregon at Washington State is going to be on Fox in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, that one, Washington State always seems to do pretty good numbers for whatever reason. Uh, Maryland at Michigan is my last one here. That's my number six on this. Uh, I think just the Michigan brand itself is going to be enough to get them at least in the top six um, because I don't imagine that game's going to be close. I just, I just don't believe that that one's going to be close. All right, which games are going to be the most exciting or the closest this week? Uh, Duke and Kansas, I think, is going to be incredibly exciting. I think you're going to see some big plays. I think you're going to see uh, a close ball game. Obviously, if you watch the BetUS TV show, you know my thoughts on, on who will cover this one. Uh, but Duke and Kansas, uh, obviously, two pretty new coaches. Mike Oko in his first year, Lance Leipold in his second. You got two stud quarterbacks. Riley Leonard and Jalen Daniels. I think that's going to be awesome. Uh, Baylor at Iowa State could be interesting. Like, a Baylor, obviously, huge year last year. Dave Aranda, of course, just rocking and rolling. They lost a bunch of guys. They still got talent on that team. Iowa State, kind of the same situation. Lost a bunch of guys. It appears that the new guys have developed pretty well inside of the Matt Campbell's culture. That's going to be an interesting one. TCU at SMU. If you want to see big plays... Yeah, just, just watch Max Duggan throw the football. Just watch. It's going to be awesome. Uh, that's an early game. I, I think that that one's going to be insane. It's Sonny Dykes going back to SMU. Uh, I, there's, of course, all the crap from last year when Gary Patterson was accusing SMU players of knocking over Jerry Kill 
or like hitting Jerry Gale, whatever it was. It was bonkers, and there was no video evidence. Like the video showed that nothing like that happened, and he doubled down on it. And then, of course, he got fired, and now they've got Sonny Dykes, who they took from SMU, and that becomes interesting because Sonny Dykes and Rhett Lashley, of course, coached with each other at SMU. So, again, interesting, interesting game. Notre Dame-UNC, I think, could be really close. Uh, I've got no idea what to expect from Notre Dame's offense in this one because you know that North Carolina's defense has holes. But also, like we haven't seen anybody stop North Carolina's offense. Does Notre Dame have the dudes to be able to do that? That's that's going to be interesting. Arkansas, excuse me, no, Arizona at Cal, I think could be really close. Arizona has looked good. Are, are they good enough to go up against Justin Wilcox's defense and put up points? I mean, we saw Mississippi State's defense hold him to 17. It, no, Wilcox does not run that same 335 that Zach Arnett does, but it, they still know how to stop some of these high-flying uh, pass options and whatnot. I, I wonder what Jaden DeLar is going to do because sometimes you put him in a tricky situation, he'll throw the ball to the wrong team. Uh, I think Arizona can keep that thing close, but but we'll we'll see. I think that's a very exciting game. Arkansas, Texas A&M, we don't need to say a whole lot about that one. Uh, Sam Pittman circles this one every single year. A&M has not exactly shown the ability to throw the football. Well, throwing the football is Arkansas's only defensive weakness, really. Uh, That could be very interesting. And then if you want some fireworks, figure out how to get the Pac-12 network before Saturday night because I think USC and Oregon State are going to put up a bunch of points. I don't think either defense is really good. I don't think either offense is going to turn the ball over so, if that's the case, I think you're just going to see a lot of points just up and down the field all night. Which teams have the most to gain and the most to lose? Now, that is a tricky one here. Um, the most to gain, most to lose for me. First off, North Carolina. Uh, you got a chance to beat Notre Dame and be undefeated going into ACC play after losing Sam Howell and all that. Uh, they get Josh Downs back this week. And just saying, uh, Iowa State, with a chance to move to 4-0 and a year after losing all those play, Everybody thought that Iowa State was going to come back down to earth. And obviously, they came back down to earth last year with a 7-5 and record in the regular season, but uh, they were quote-unquote playoff contenders last year. The year before that, they made it to a, a Fiesta Bowl. They were in the Big 12 title game. Like, all these different things that Iowa State was, was amping up for, they got... A bunch of the seniors out of the way. They bring in Hunter Deckers. They got Xavier uh, Hutchinson doing things. The running game has not been great. Don't get me wrong. But, like, they got a chance to be 4-0 going to undefeated Kansas next week. I mean, that's massive. Marshall at Troy. Both of these teams need to get up off the mat in the worst way. Marshall, of course, with that big upset over Notre Dame. Then they come back home and they get beat outright by Bowling Green in overtime. Yeah, you, you need to go on the road and find a way to beat Troy here. But Troy also losing on a Hail Mary at App State. Uh, Troy is also getting some guys back this week that they did not have available last week. That's going to be interesting. Both of those need a win to stay in the Sun Belt race here. Uh, Arkansas at Texas A&M, most to gain, most to lose for both of those. A&M cannot afford another loss. Not right now. They, they got some big things on the horizon. You cannot afford a loss to Arkansas. Same regard, Arkansas uh, starts out the season pretty well. You don't want to lose this game before you have to face Alabama next week, right? You don't want a three-game winning streak to turn into a two-game losing streak. And that's not to say that they're going to lose to Alabama, but just saying you lose this one, all of a sudden the prospects for an upset next week in Fayetteville don't look as good. Um, Tennessee and Florida, both of those with the most to gain, most to lose. Florida, obviously you started off with a fantastic fantastic win over Utah at home. Uh, The last two games have not appeared so well. I mean, almost getting beat by USF at home, not good. Uh, Along with that, you've also got uh, the loss to Kentucky. Tennessee, of course, the offense left a little bit to be desired against Pitt. Uh, Both of these teams need a win here in a really bad way. At Tennessee, I think they, they want to continue this hype like the Josh Heupel hype. And you need a win here to do that, especially with college game day coming, et cetera. Uh, and the last one here, Baylor, Iowa State. I mean, well, no, 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 Baylor, I guess, is the other one. You've already lost a game. 
You only lost two out of 14 last year. So if you're Baylor, you don't want to equal your loss total in the first four games, especially heading into conference play. I mean, that's just it. You don't want to start out 0-1 in the conference. Uh, you got to find a way to get a win at Iowa State here uh, if you're going to do anything in the Big 12, for sure. Uh, the most likely 10-point-plus underdog outright winner. So uh, the double-digit underdog winner that can win outright this weekend. I got three of them. Take a take a little money line shot on on all three of these. Louisiana Tech plus thirteen and a half. That's a uh, money line is plus four twenty five at South Alabama. Look, South Alabama went to Central Michigan and won. Went to UCLA and was that close. Got beat on a last second field goal. Now they're coming back home against a team in Louisiana Tech that has shown that they can sling the football. It took them a little while to get the right quarterback set up in Sonny Cumbie's offense, but they are going to take chances. They're going to take some shots, and if your offense is not clicking, if you come back home and think you're going to be comfortable, and they, Louisiana Tech might have a thing or two to say. So keep an eye on that one. Uh, my second one here, Southern Miss, plus 13 at Tulane. Tulane coming off of their first ever P5 win under Willie Fritz. Situationally, this one makes a whole lot of sense. Zach Wilkie is, of course, going to be starting again for Southern Miss, but Ty Keyes is going to be able to come in there and uh, give some relief, etc. Will Hall is going to do some fun stuff, and you know that Will Hall's offense is going to be a lot of fun. Will Hall was the offensive coordinator at Tulane. These two coaching staffs know each other. They know what they're doing. 13 points. Mm, Southern Miss plus 400 right there. That's going to be tricky. And then finally, I'm putting this one on here just to say that I I called it if it happens. Do I believe it's going to happen? No. Do I think there's a chance? Outside possibility. Wisconsin, plus 19. They are plus 700 at Ohio State. All of the shine has been taken off of this game. And, And the reason it was taken off of this game is because Washington State lost at home to excuse me, Wisconsin lost at home to Washington State. Yes, I I get it, right? A team that lost to Washington State at home probably is not going to go on the road and beat Ohio State, especially at night, especially in the black black, black jerseys, black helmets, whatever. But Jim Leonard's defense, I, I think that he can find a way. I mean, we have seen now that Ohio State's offense you can find ways to maybe shut them down a little bit. And we saw Notre Dame do it, and I don't think they're as good as Wisconsin is. On top of that, if you get a performance out of Graham Mertz where he doesn't turn the football over in critical, critical situations, I think Wisconsin can run the ball on these guys. Uh, this is exactly what we saw with Michigan last year. Now, don't get me wrong. I think Michigan last year is better than Wisconsin this year, etc. But... Just saying, this team is built like one of those teams that Ohio State can have trouble with. Maybe we pay attention to this one. Uh, Last thing on the docket here for the previews, the G5 games of the week. And write my times down. Uh, Marshall at Troy, I think it's going to be very, very interesting. This is is a fun spot. Um, Because both of them coming off of Last second losses, Marshall in overtime, Troy on a Hail Mary at App State. Um, Both of them need a win. I think this one's going to be a lot of fun. It's on NFL Network. Toledo at San Diego State. This is the first time San Diego State has been a a non-P5 underdog in a non-conference game in, I think, 35 games is what they said. I mean, it's been a very, very long time. Uh, So Toledo, you know, getting blasted by Ohio State last week. Now they get to go to San Diego State and face that 335. San Diego State's got some things going on. James Madison at App State. I don't know of any team that has had a better run in the month of September than App State. I mean, yes, obviously, really weird losing that game to North Carolina at home in week one. But week two, you go down to Texas A&M and you get a win. You come back home, you get college game day. You get Troy, who's an in, uh, not in-state, excuse me, uh, uh, in-conference opponent. And you win on a Hail Mary on the last play of the game? Yeah, it doesn't get much better than that. Now, of course, James Madison, 
who is uh, who's going to have their first year in FBS this year. James Madison looks good. That spread's only about seven points. Keep an eye out for that situationally. Southern Miss at Tulane is another G5 game of the week. Obviously, I talked about that. Will Hall and Willie Fritz, of course, coached together at Tulane. And then this one I'm tossing in here, UNLV at Utah State. Utah State, I don't know what is going on with Blake Anderson's program. They have not been able to replicate their 2021 success when they won the Mountain West. UNLV, on the other hand, Marcus Arroyo's bunch is figuring it out. They are figuring it out. Brumfeld, the quarterback, pretty good. Ricky White, the transfer wide receiver from Michigan State, he can take the top off the defense. And, of course, Robbins at running back. This is a potent, potent team. I think the market might be missing on these guys. Just saying. Uh, UNLV at Utah State. If Utah State can find a way to have some success here, yeah, this could be a really, really interesting game. Uh, if it's not, it's still it's another coming out party for UNLV. So, I mean, and, and last week was really close to that because they beat the absolute breaks off of North Texas. Just smoked them. Smoked them. All right. Uh, let's hit two more ads. In the, well, one more ad. I guess whatever. The second ad. Blah. You guys get it. Uh, and then we're doing our college football picks against the spread. Don't forget, join the picks contest. Go to winningcureseverything.com. Hit that contest button. Make sure that you are signed up. The winner each week gets a $25 Amazon gift card. And, of course, a $50 free play from BetUS if you have an account over there. So make sure that you are signed up. Winningcureseverything.com. And then hit the contest page. Let's do this. We're going to start off with Baylor and Iowa State. Let's check out some things you should know about. Follow the show on Twitter at Winning Cures. And you can follow Gary at Gary WCE. You can also follow on Facebook. Got your own podcast or web show? Looking to start one? Or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? Well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. And if you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show too. Subscribe on YouTube to get not only full Winning Cures Everything shows, but individual segments and other goodies as well. We're over 6,000 subscribers, and our goal by the end of the year is 7,500. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to Gary at winningcureseverything.com, and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now, back to the show. All right, let's get into it. College football under the radar picks against the spread for week number four. Thus far on the season, I am 19 and 17 against the spread on these games. Now, I will go ahead and preface this with letting you know my best bets, my official plays, the ones that I am betting, I give out on the BetUS College Football Show over on BetUS TV. There's a link in the description. You can go back and watch the Tuesday and Wednesday shows there. On these, I just like to give a breakdown in which way I would lean on them, right? I'm not putting money on these games specific. If I do, it's it definitely ain't a full unit, right? I ain't putting hundreds on any of these. But uh, but I might put some pizza money on something along these lines if I feel really, really strongly about it. But I will let you know one way or the other about these. So uh, last week went five and seven again. I started nine and three in week one, went five and seven in week two, five and seven in week three. So, let's see what we got here. Let's start it off. Number one here. This is going to be a long show. Baylor at Iowa State. Now, let's go on and pull up the spreadsheet. These are the current numbers. These are this year's numbers. There are no priors in this. This is my formula and my numbers on this. So, if you see something different uh, anywhere else, that's what's up. Uh, Now, I do have... A couple of different sets of formulas that I run through. This is the main one with just the stats, right? Just stats. Uh, you look at this game. Iowa State is a two and a half point favorite. Latest line at BetUS. The total sits at forty five and a half. It's twelve p.m. Eastern time game on ESPN two. Uh, Baylor is nineteen and seven against the spread in their last twenty six against winning teams. Iowa State, after a straight up win, they are three and seven against the spread in their last ten. Uh, you look at Matt Campbell, he is not normally good in these kind of situations. Um, I mean, it's it's bad. 5-12 and 12 against the spread. Chris Felica from Game Day actually put this out. Uh, but he said that uh, in games where the spread is between, you know, minus 2.5 and, and plus 2.5, and 
Matt Campbell is 5-12 and 12 against the number. He has not been good in these spots. Now, if you just look at the numbers, there's not really a mismatch that you can point to here. Um, I, I don't see, you know, other than, I, I know this, Iowa State not good at running the football. Uh, Baylor really good at stopping it. Um, as far as passing offense goes, Iowa State, I mean, not great. We're looking at number 40 um, in PPA per pass, and Baylor's sitting at number 38 on defense. Uh, Iowa State's not explosive throwing the football. They're not explosive running the football. Um, field position, like Baylor seems to be doing better against that. Uh, Iowa State better on defense, but again, when you play Iowa and then, uh, you know, a couple of G5 FCS teams, obviously the numbers are going to look good there. Now, this is very much uh, weighted. It's it's opponent-adjusted, right? So strength of schedule here at number 92. The ESPN strength of record metric is, is strange because it's got Iowa State at number 17, and I think that's because of the win at Iowa. Uh, but I think that they value Iowa a little more than I do. So regardless, um, you look at this, you know, at number 66 strength of schedule, uh, Baylor's got a loss at BYU in overtime, where they missed a couple of field goals. If special teams comes into play here, yeah, Baylor could maybe see some issues. But when I look at all these stats, um, I'd, I'm going to ride with Baylor to cover here, plus the two and a half. I need to see it from Iowa State in a close game, it, even at home. Like, I just need to see it. So I'm going to ride with Baylor to cover the two and a half. Uh, that metric about Matt Campbell... Or that that stat five and twelve against the spread in games, you know, between two and a half and two and a half. Yikes! I don't like that one. I don't like that at all. All right, moving along. Missouri at Auburn. Auburn is a seven point favorite. The total sits at fifty one and a half over at BetUS. It's twelve p.m. Eastern time, and it is on ESPN. Uh, T.J. Finley is out for this game. Uh, let's move along to <laughs> the next. There we go. The next one. Um, and TJ Finley out for this one. Missouri 9-25 and 25 in their last 34 road games uh, against the number. Auburn is 6-1 and one against the spread coming off of a double-digit home loss uh, in their last seven in that position. It doesn't happen often, but when they do, obviously, uh, <laughs> yeah, you get the point. Uh, there's all this negative attention around Brian Harson. Obviously, the quarterback is out for this game, etc. I, I do wonder if this team is not better without TJ Finley on the field to make mistakes. And I know that that sounds harsh. I get that. But when I look at this, uh, I think that there are ways that that Auburn can win this game. Now, my spread on it's Auburn 8.76. I think Auburn can cover this spread. I think Auburn can cover seven. Uh, I think they have the best running back on the field in this game. Uh, you look at the PPA per rush on defense for Missouri, number 65. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that Auburn can take advantage of that. Big time. When you look at the offense for Missouri, I, I think Auburn has ways that they can stop what Missouri's doing. Um, I, I, I just, I believe that Auburn will find a way to win this game. I don't expect them to win a ton of games this year. But I, I think Auburn can cover this game. So I will take Harson and them to rally the troops and get a big one here. Uh, Auburn covering seven. I think Robbie Ashford probably going to play quarterback for him. Um, you might see some Calzada. I mean, who knows? But I, I do think Auburn ends up getting the cover on this one. Maryland at Michigan. Tricky game. Tricky game here. Michigan, a 17-point home favorite. Latest line at BetUS. Total sits at 64 and a half. It's a 12 p.m. Eastern time game on Fox. Looking at the trends, of course, Maryland 17 and 37 against the spread in 54 games against winning teams. It has been brutal there forever. They beat up on bad teams and they lose big against good teams. Michigan 8 and 3 against the spread in their last 11 home games. And on top of that, Michigan has covered six straight against Maryland. They always always seem to find a way to uh, to get a cover in this spot. You look at these, uh, you look at the matchup here, look at the numbers. I don't believe that the market has caught up to exactly how good Michigan is with J.J. McCarthy in the lineup. Uh, the offense, J.J. McCarthy has led the offense to scores on 13 out of 14 drives that he has been the starting quarterback. 
or that he has been the quarterback, right? And I think 12 of those were touchdowns. Only one was a field goal. Like, only one did they not score on. Now, I understand that the strength of the schedule is uh, lacking, right? Definitely lacking. When you look at this, uh, their strength of schedule is 131. Maryland's is 105. So it's not like Maryland's exactly been going up against, uh, you know, beasts every single week. They, they had an impressive win over SMU last week. I will tell you one thing. SMU is not Michigan. And, of course, Maryland has to go on the road here. So Michigan getting to play an actual, real-life, breathing opponent, I think there's going to be a lot of fire here. I think they're going to be fired up for this game. I think Michigan is going to smoke these dudes. Now, my number is 26.59. That is well over the 17 here. Um, at, now, the total, I mean, 64 and a half. Uh, my total on it is 75. Uh, I, I don't know that I would trust these totals numbers because this is just based on stats for this year. Um, but I look at it, and I just think Michigan is significantly more talented than Maryland. I don't think Maryland's defense is going to be able to stop them. I do think Michigan's defense will be able to slow down uh, Talia Tagovailoa. I, I understand that they've got a great wide receiver core, but when you pressure Talia a little bit, and sometimes he gets a little, a little iffy with the football. We'll just say that he he has been known to throw it to the wrong team. If he does that here, they will get demolished. So I expect Michigan to win this big, big, big. So yes. Uh, Give me Michigan to cover the 17 on that. Minnesota heads to East Lansing. And Michigan State is a home dog of three points here. Total sits at 51. It's 3.30 p.m. Eastern time on the Big Ten Network. That's the latest line over at BetUS, of course. Looking at this, uh, Minnesota has not been favored over. i got to switch these things over, I swear. Uh, i got to fix my button. Minnesota has not been favored over Michigan State since 2006. Now, they've played a lot. Eight times in that span. Minnesota is 7-1 and one against the spread in their last eight against Michigan State. How insane is that? Good gracious. So, uh, now obviously, these numbers are based on just this season. There's no priors. There's no whatever. It is opponent adjusted, but even still, Minnesota's numbers have been absolutely, I mean, just they have been barbaric in the way that they have just smoked some of these teams that they have played. Now they got to go on the road and they've got to try and do it against Michigan State, who is, of course, coming off of that loss to Washington last week on the road in Seattle. And you look at some of these numbers, obviously they're not going to mesh up quite the same. Strength of schedule is number 41 for Michigan State, number 130 for Minnesota. I look at this, I mean, Minnesota has been so efficient running the football, uh, and they continue to do that, and, of course, stopping the run. Uh, you look at their defense, they're number three in PPA per pass defense. So, Peyton Thorne, you ain't got a whole lot that you can look forward to this week either, bud. Uh, PPA per rush, number 19 for Minnesota's defense against number 53 for Michigan, or excuse me, Michigan State. Uh, Michigan State, Last week, they were taken out of the game. Their running game was taken out of the game because they got down so quick. I don't expect Minnesota to just rush out to three straight touchdowns the way that Washington did, but it's a possibility, even without Chris Altman-Bell in the lineup, which he's out for the year now, and that obviously uh, hurts Minnesota's offense. But what Soraka has been doing thus far has been pretty awesome. If you look at Minnesota's offensive numbers, you scroll all the way down here, number eight PPA per pass. They're only throwing the ball 32.65% of the time. Uh, so that's number 127 in the country as far as pass rate. Uh, rush rate, 66.67% there. Uh, PPA per rush, they're number four in the country. Now, Michigan State, their defense can stop the rush. But they've only, they've only faced a run 44% of the time. That's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm very interested to see this game. Very interested. I think Minnesota is a really, really good team. And I think Michigan State has some problems. I, just, I don't trust this team for whatever reason. So I'm I'm going to roll with Minnesota. to cover. The, I'm going to trust the numbers here. Uh, but I'll take Minnesota to cover this one on the road, even in East Lansing. Give me the Gophers. Give me the Gophers. 
Notre Dame heads to Chapel Hill to face off against North Carolina. That line currently is North Carolina favored by one and a half at home. It's the total of 55 and a half. Latest numbers at BetUS. This was 3.30 p.m. Eastern time on ABC. It's a prime time spot right there in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, Notre Dame 7-3 and three against the spread. Their last 10 against ACC opposition. They're 2-0 and oh against the spread against North Carolina in the last two seasons. Here's my question. Uh, can Notre Dame stop Drake May? I don't know that I believe it. I don't think that they can. Uh, they'll slow him down more than other teams have, obviously. Uh, again, my numbers on this, just way screwy. Uh, I've got North Carolina favored by almost 17 points. I don't think that that's entirely accurate, but when you look at the numbers from this year, like, yeah, uh, strength of schedule is number 80 for North Carolina, and it's number 5 for Notre Dame. Notre Dame has played Cal, they have played Ohio State, and uh, they have played... Marshall, and yeah, obviously it took a little bit of hit last week against Marshall, but regardless, um, the roster strength is not that far off from each other. I've got a total of 50 on this, uh, the actual total at BetUS is 55 and a half right now. I, I don't think that Notre Dame can score enough to keep up with North Carolina. That's what I'm looking at here. Uh, when you look at the offense, number 119 PPA per pass, Number 98 PPA per rush. Now, I understand that North Carolina's defense is really, really bad. Do not get me wrong. Um, you look at standard downs PPA. Uh, you look at third down attempts per game, all that. Like, Notre Dame does not have a lot of third down attempts per game, but that's because they don't have a lot of drives per game. Like, they're they're not great in standard downs. They're not great in passing downs. Um, this is just really difficult to find a path to victory for Notre Dame in this one. Uh, turnovers would help. North Carolina hadn't exactly shown the propensity to turn the football over. I am going to lean North Carolina on this uh, to cover minus one and a half at home. Uh, yes, Notre Dame, everywhere they go, it is going to be a big game. This is a tricky one. So I will I will ride with the Tar Heels here. Uh, Mac Brown, surprising everybody again. Give me, give me North Carolina to cover one and a half. Moving right along, we got six more games, and I'm already over an hour. I appreciate you guys for watching. Like the video for me if you are watching right now, of course. And jump into the chat. Obviously, we love to see all your different picks, etc. I want to know what you guys think about these games. Uh, but yes, Texas at Texas Tech. Whew. 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN. Texas, a seven-point road favorite. Total of 60, of course, latest lines over at BetUS. Uh, Texas is 7-3 and three against the spread their last 10 against Texas Tech. Quinn Ewers is traveling and will suit up in this game, according to Steve Sarkeesian. Interesting. Heard that he was out for like six to eight weeks. He's been out for like two. What is going on here? Um, I look at this number, and uh, what did we say the total was? 60 on this. My total on it is 55.82. Um, Texas Tech... You know, I've got a score of uh, 34 and a half to 21 and a quarter. So 13.27, around about 13 points on this. Uh, the line, you know, over at BetUS is actually seven. I think I'm going to ride with Texas. I think, especially if Quinn Ewers does show up at this game, I don't care if he gets in the game or not. Uh, if he is out there on the sideline, uh, there's something about that where a guy comes back early to be with his teammates, etc. Like it kind of rejuvenates. The guys, it rejuvenates the team. Um, and Texas, I mean, like I said, they're 7-3 and three against the spread in their last 10 against Texas Tech. Even when they were bad, they found ways to cover against Texas Tech. Um, in Texas Tech, you, you want to see interesting things here. Even with Zach Kitley, they're number 104 in PPA per pass, and yet they're throwing the ball 63% of the time. What? Like, why are we doing this? Uh, at the same token, number 16 in PPA per rush. And yet, they're only running the ball 37% of the time. That's number 118 in the country. Unless they flip that thing around, I do not see it ending. E even if they do turn it around, uh, I mean, Texas's weakness is obviously against the pass. I mean, they're number 60 PPA per pass on this. Uh, as far as Texas's offense, 
Like, no, they're not great against the run. Or they're not great running the ball. How's that? Even with B. John Robinson, uh, the numbers have not exactly been great. They're number 86 in success right here. Uh, but PPA per rush for Texas Tech, I mean, number 18, uh, number 15 in rushing explosiveness, et cetera. Like, I think these numbers are obviously going to change because, again, you look at strength of schedule, number 13 for Texas, number 50 for Texas Tech. I think Texas has enough to be able to uh, win this game by more than a touchdown. I know it's a tricky spot after the UTSA game, et cetera, but I do think Texas is going to be focused here. Texas Tech coming back home after getting just drubbed. I say drubbed. It wasn't awful, but you're going to be beat up when you play NC State, bottom line. So I do think uh, that Texas is going to be able to cover that seven uh, on the road in Lubbock. That's that's going to be an interesting, interesting spot. So let's, let's, uh, let's see what happens there. But I'll ride with the Longhorns on that. Indiana is headed to Cincinnati. And Cincinnati is a 16.5-point favorite over at BetUS. The total sits at 57.5. It's a 3.30 p.m. Eastern time game, of course, and they just stacked all these games at the same time, right in the middle of the afternoon, of course. But uh, but that one's on ESPN2. Let's go on and pull up the stats here. Um, you look at the trend. Cincy 5-1 and one against the spread their last six at home. Indiana is 2-8 and eight against the spread in their last 10 against winning teams. Indiana is so interesting. They are 3-0. and They've not looked great, certainly. Uh, and when you look at this, I mean, they're number 102 strength of schedule, but number 19 strength of record. Again, it's something. something's off. Something's weird about this ESPN number. But regardless, uh, we don't use that anyway, so it, I, I just have it for context. Uh, I've got a score of Cincinnati 27-16. to Now, the total over at BetUS is 57.5. My total is 43.82. But these are just raw numbers, no priors, et cetera. So, obviously, proceed with caution if you're going to use my numbers on this. Uh, but this is just raw stats from this season. So, pay attention. Uh, you look at this, Indiana is not great at anything. However, uh, Cincinnati is number 81 in PPA per pass, right? Indiana has not been great at that. Number 82 PPA per pass on offense. But when you look at the pass rate, et cetera, I think that there are ways that Indiana can exploit Cincinnati's defense. Remember, this game last year was 38-24. to uh, Cincinnati got the win, and they didn't look great doing it. Uh, I want to say they were down, or they were nearly down at the half, and Indiana's linebacker went out for a targeting or whatever. It was a weird spot, uh, but since he was expected to win that game by more last year, uh this this one stat here, pass explosiveness. Um, Indiana's number 18 in that metric, and Cincinnati is number 103. Indiana does like to throw the deep ball, especially with DJ Matthews. Um, Basil Act Matthews, I think it's been a lot of fun. This is an interesting game to me because I feel like people have been crapping on Indiana all week long, talking about how bad Cincinnati was going to beat them, etc. I still expect Cincinnati to win the game because I don't think Indiana is is great, obviously. I know they're 3-0, and but I do think that Indiana can keep this game relatively close. I think you hit a couple of big plays, etc. Uh, that defense can find a way to do something, I, I would imagine. Um, but Fickle's bunch, like, they're good. They ain't great either. So let's let's see what ends up happening here. Um, yeah, I'm. I think I'm. I'm going to ride Indiana to cover the sixteen and a half here. Uh, I just think that they're better than people are giving them credit for. And no, I mean the numbers don't necessarily spell that out for you. But I, I do think maybe we're undervaluing Indiana just a just a touch, just a smidge. So Indiana to cover sixteen and a half on the road at Cincy. Moving along, we got a few more here. Oregon at Washington State. <laughs> I think you guys understand how much I enjoy the Palouse and all the games that happen there. Jake Dickert has done a fantastic job there. Uh, Washington State is a seven-point underdog at home, total of 57.5 over at BetUS. It's 4 p.m. Eastern time on Fox on this one. Uh, Oregon, 2-0 against the spread against Washington State in the last two years. 
That's great, right? Obviously, but you've got a new coach there. You got a new coach at Washington State, et cetera. Um, if you just take it over over ten years, that's the only two times that Oregon has covered against Washington State in the last ten meetings between these teams. Just unbelievable. Um, Bo Nix, I talked about this on Three Dog Thursday on Bet US TV. Bo Nix has thirty touchdowns and two interceptions at home. Just lights out when he plays at home. When he goes on the road. 16 touchdowns, 16 interceptions, road and neutral. Uh, Jake Dickert's defense, the scheme is really interesting. I think they they have some hybrid guys. They change it up routinely. Uh, my number on this, I mean, this is effectively a pick em. Like and, and again, this is raw stats, so it's based on you got to toss in the Oregon numbers against Georgia as well. But you also got to toss in Washington State's numbers when they went to Wisconsin. I think Washington State's a pretty good football team. Like I, I understand Oregon looked great against BYU last week. I get it. But this one, very, very interesting to me because I could see ways that, you know, uh, you can pass the football on Oregon. I see ways that you can maybe run the football on Oregon. Um. I don't think their defense is that great. I think BYU was coming off of an absolute just war with Baylor. And when you look at, you know, the defense against the offense, Washington State's defense has been pretty good. Like, just look at the... You see all the green on the left side of your screen here? That's Washington State's defense. I think... And here's the other thing. Washington State loves to slow this thing down. Uh, 84 plays per game. I mean, they run clock. They keep it easy. I look at this, and I could see a way that Washington State wins the game, so I am certainly going to take them plus seven here. Um, There's no real mismatch or anything. I believe that Washington State can keep it within seven. So I'm going to ride with the Cougars here for sure. Next on the docket here, Marshall heads to Troy. I talked about this a little bit in the preview. But 7 p.m. Eastern Time on NFL Network, Troy is a three and a half point home dog. Total of 51 and a half. Uh, Marshall, four and one against the spread in their last five on the road. Troy is one and five against the spread in their last six at home. Now, obviously, this goes uh, Charles Huff has already been there, but John Sumrall not exactly had a lot of home games here. So let's see what happens. Let's see what goes on. Uh, Troy is returning several guys that did not play against App State last week. I think they will be uh, very useful this week. I will certainly say that. Now, uh, my numbers on this, and these are, of course, the raw numbers, etc. My numbers on this have Marshall covering the game, winning by eight points. Uh, They're a three and a half point favorite. I'm going to go against my number on this. Um, I think Troy's defense is really, really good. You look at that strength of schedule, number 19 for Troy, number 55 for Marshall. Uh, Yes, a win over Notre Dame is pretty cool. I don't know that I could say that Troy wouldn't have been able to go and beat Notre Dame two Saturdays ago. Just saying. I think that Troy and their defense are incredibly, incredibly talented and I think Sumrall has some schemes that can really give Marshall some fits. You look at Marshall's numbers, number two in PPA per pass. They are number 58 in PPA per rush. And I look at this, and I, I think, uh, excuse me, number two in PPA per pass defense, uh, number 58 per rush defense. I think Gunnar Watson is doing some pretty interesting things. Like, I think he has been way more effective than we want to give him credit for. And I I think Troy will find a way to put up some points here. But the biggest thing is, I think they are going to be able to stymie that offense for Marshall. Uh, I think the defense is better than what the numbers you're seeing are because obviously they've played App State and they've played uh, uh, Ole Miss already on the year. So, yeah, Troy, it's kind of difficult. This kind of a must-win spot for both of these teams. Marshall coming off of a loss against Bowling Green. Um, Yeah, I understand. They beat Notre Dame. I get it. And Troy played App State close. But Marshall got beat by Bowling Green. Uh, I think I'm going to ride with Troy on this. This feels like a last-second win for either one of these teams. I think Troy can win the game. 
I will certainly take them as the underdog here. So give me Troy to cover three and a half. Southern Miss at Tulane. This is an interesting one, if for no other reason than, of course, the Southern Miss head coach, Will Hall, was the offensive coordinator for Tulane when they really got that thing rolling under Willie Fritz. Now, Willie Fritz is, of course, still at Tulane, still doing Willie Ball. Tulane is a 13-point favorite, total of 48.5 over at BetUS. It's on ESPN Plus, 7 p.m. Eastern time. These are two teams that are trending in the right direction. Southern Miss, 6-0 and against the spread in their last six games. Uh, Tulane, 5-0 and against the spread in their last five games. Uh, this is a tricky, tricky handicap. Uh, Southern Miss is, is starting... The freshman quarterback, Zach Wilkes. Uh, but he's going to play Ty Keys some. Now, I don't know exactly what that means necessarily. But you look at what Southern Miss has been able to do thus far. They have been this close in so many different games. Uh, they played Miami really, really tough in the first half. And then, of course, just depth finally wore out. And Miami ran away with that thing. Uh, they blasted uh, Northwestern Louisiana State or whoever. Northwestern State, I guess, last week. Um, this offense... If you allow them to get going, they will find a way to put up points uh, so long as all their quarterbacks don't get injured, right? I I have to wonder about this spot. Now, the number is right on what it should be. I, I told you they're favored by 13 over at BetUS. My number has Tulane favored by 13. Uh, the total is 48.5. Well, my total is 47.5. I think I'm very interested in this. I think the spot is really difficult because Tulane is coming off of their first P5 win under Willie Fritz. They went to Kansas State and got the W 17-10 last week. Now you're coming back. You're a double-digit home favorite. Your, your head coach is going up against a former coordinator that did good things at the school but you know still doesn't have it built yet at Southern Miss. You know, da-da-da-da-da. It's very tricky to me. I, I have to wonder... I, I think Southern Miss could find a way to win this game. I think they can keep it within 13. I think Will Hall, obviously these two coaching staffs know each other, but I think Will Hall is going to have some things up his sleeves here with Frank Gore Jr., etc. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to call an outright upset, but I will call Southern Miss plus 13 at Tulane. Uh, I know Tulane won this game last year handily, but different teams. I like Michael Pratt. I like what he's doing. I think Southern Miss finds a way to keep this thing pretty close. I think they got a shot at the end to win the game. So I will take Southern Miss plus the 13 on that one. Next on the board, we got two more games here. Iowa heads to Rutgers. Yes, it is the Sickos game of the week. Good gracious. The total is at 34, and Rutgers is a seven and a half point home dog here over at BetUS, of course. Uh, the numbers, of course, provided by BetUS. 7 p.m. Eastern time on FS1. Uh, these two teams have only played twice. And Iowa is 0-1 when they play in New Jersey. Now, that was 2016, so it's a little bit different now. Um, you look at this, Rutgers' uh, top two quarterbacks are probably going to be out for this game. More than likely. Uh, I told you the total sits at 34. Well, let's go on and, and pop it up here. My projected total is 34.8. Now, this is based on the raw numbers just from this year, and I've actually got the wrong team favored. I've got Rutgers favored by five. I do not trust these numbers, obviously. But Iowa has broken every metric that you could possibly come up with because it, you have to find a way to toss in special team scores and defensive scores and turnovers and short fields and blah, blah. And I don't know of a way that you can accurately predict that. I just have no idea. Uh, I will tell you this. Uh, the Rutgers offense was not great anyway. They run the ball a lot, 61% of the time. But I believe that without their top two quarterbacks, to even have any kind of a hint or any kind of a threat of a pass, I, it doesn't matter what these numbers say on this screen. I think Iowa's going to cover the 7.5, and, and I think they're going to do it by playing defense and special team scores and a short field and et cetera, et cetera. They're going to find a way to get a fumble or something. I'm going to trust that Iowa is able to cover 7.5. Uh, I would not throw any money on this game because, oh, my God, this is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Look at how good Rutgers' uh, defensive numbers are, by the way. You see all the all the blue? 
on this left side. Excuse me, not blue. All the green on that left side. And then how bad Iowa's offensive numbers are. Yeah, it's it's bad juju. But then it's, it's basically the same up here for Iowa's defense. These are two good defensive teams. Um, you look at PPA per play, Iowa's number nine, Rutgers number 31. PPA defense per drive, Iowa's number 10 over here, and Rutgers is number 32. Like, these offenses are not going to be able to move the football. Yeah, seven and a half feels like too much, but also Rutgers without quarterbacks, uh, that's not good. That's not good. I am very curious to watch this game, though, because I want to see what Sean Gleason does, the uh, Rutgers offense coordinator. I want to see how he tries to attack this. We'll see. All right, finally, last game on the docket. We've got Utah at Arizona State. Oh, my. 10.30 p.m. Eastern time. It's going to be a late one on ESPN, of course. Uh, this is the game that ESPN chose instead of picking USC and Oregon State. Or Arizona State is a 16-point home dog, a total of 54 over at BetUS. Uh, Arizona State 5-0 and against the spread at home against teams with a winning record. And Utah is 7-3 and against the spread against teams with a losing record in their last 10. Just in this individual matchup, though, Utah is 6-2 and against Arizona State. 6-2 and against the spread against Arizona State. So why don't we go on and bring up the numbers here. I've got Utah favored by 12.45. That does not mean that I'm going to take Utah in this game. Obviously, Arizona State uh, fired Herm Edwards. I, I don't know about the running backs coach that took over as the interim. And I look at these numbers, and Arizona State, yes, they had to play Oklahoma State. Utah went and played at Florida. Strength of schedule actually favors Arizona State as of right now. Um, but, man, which says something when Eastern Michigan appears to be a better opponent than San Diego State, right? That's something. Um, but you look at this, you know, PPA margin certainly favors Utah. Uh, look at the offensive success rate for Arizona State. Number 127. Uh, this is going to be a tricky spot for Arizona State. you got to be able to keep these guys engaged. I don't know how well they can do that because I think that Utah will be able to score early and often. That's my read on this. I think that they score a lot in this game. Um, but then again, I mean, you never know. Uh, you, you see penalties per game here, 27. Uh, and number 27, excuse me, for Utah, only five penalties per game. Uh, Arizona State, almost to 10 penalties per game. The number 116 in the country. The, this one could get out of hand because I don't know how invested in the program the Arizona State players are. You got a whole slew of transfers. Do they do they still fight and play for this running backs coach that's the new interim? Do they play for those guys? Or do they just kind of pack it in and uh, we'll figure out what we do next year? I'm I'm curious. I'm gonna side with Utah on this. Uh, because I think even if Arizona State were to try, I think that Utah is as good as uh, Oklahoma State, and Oklahoma State won by 17. I mean, Utah favored by 16? I'll take it. I'm going to go against my number on this. I uh, I will take this one. I will roll Utah to cover 16 on that. All right. Uh, quick recap of what we went through. Baylor plus 2.5. Auburn to cover 7. Michigan to cover 17. Minnesota minus 3. North Carolina minus one and a half, Texas minus seven, Indiana plus sixteen and a half, Washington State plus seven, Troy plus three and a half, Southern Miss plus thirteen, Iowa minus seven and a half, and Utah minus sixteen. Those, of course, brought to you by BetUS. It's America's premier online sports book. They are where the game begins. And make sure that you go and check out the picks contest because BetUS brings you that as well. It's over at winningcureseverything.com. Head over to the contest section there. So, good times this weekend. I think we're going to have some really, really fun games. It's, I mean, it's been awesome the first three weeks of the season. Four, if you count week zero. Uh, but I think we're going to have some really interesting stuff go on this weekend. Because we we typically do in September. We're, we're still trying to figure out these teams. So, uh, with that said, go and check out the Big U.S. College Football Show. 
It's over at BetUS TV. Of course, you can click the link in the description. If you want to sign up over at BetUS, there's a link in the description for that as well. We try and make it as easy as humanly possible for you guys. Uh, if you like the show, share it out with a friend. Tell somebody. Make sure that you like the video, of course. And why not subscribe to the channel? Help us out a little bit. That would certainly help things along. Um, I think that's going to do it. I think that's going to do it. You guys have been awesome. So thank you for everything. You have uh, really supported the shows that I am involved with. Of course, this one and the Bet U.S. College Football Show. Uh, the Twitter account, always open, at GaryWCE. You got any questions, anything like that, you can always hit me up there. Uh, DMs are open. Uh, just, just tweet me, though. It's much easier that way. <laughs> I don't always see the DMs. I always see like the notifications. I don't always see the DMs. So make sure and hit me up on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And with that said, we're going to get out of here. You guys have been fantastic. You take care of yourself, take care of each other, and hopefully all of your tickets cash this weekend. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app, and make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE, and the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show.